Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming back after the break for the last two talks. And thanks, Mark, for uh, inviting me. I'm actually really honored to be here. I've been able to watch some of the talks, and it feels like I'm sharing the stage with super creative, interesting people. They're pros at what they do, and I'm like, no, it's me. And, uh, you know, but. Um, well, a lot of what I do is prototypes, so hopefully uh, you know, you'll still get excited about what that is. But what I want to talk about today is exploring alternative interactions in uh, JavaScript. But before I show you a lot of examples, Here's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior front-end developer. Uh, I'm also on the side, I, I'm an author. I wrote a book about machine learning in JavaScript. And I'll show you a little bit of that uh, in this talk. And overall, uh, I like to call myself a creative technologist just because I like to push the boundaries of what can be done uh, on the web and uh, with JavaScript or other technologies. But as a front-end developer, working with JavaScript is a little bit easier for me. And when I'm not coding, usually I like to travel solo. This is a picture of me in Iceland, best trip of my life. And next, uh, I'm trying to plan either Greenland or Antarctica. So if somebody has been there, you know, I'm up for travel tips. Um, but this is not at all what we're going to talk about today. I want to cover the topic of human-computer interaction. So uh, the talk this morning, Tammy mentioned a little bit human-computer interaction. So just in case, if some of you have never really looked into this, uh, this is a field of research that is focused on the interaction between human and computers. So you know, I guess the first time that research actually says something in pretty simple words. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I'm going to focus on three types of inputs that you can play with in the browser and in JavaScript. But if you're not an engineer, don't worry. Uh, I'm not going to show that much code. Uh, it's mostly about a conceptual uh, vision of what you can do now uh, in the browser. And, but if you are an engineer and you want to see code, everything I'm going to show you uh, is open source on my GitHub, and I'll have a link to that uh, at the end. So it's probably good that I didn't put that much code into it, because it's like the end of the second day. So we're just going to be able to chill and hopefully get excited about different ways to interact with UIs. So first, let's talk about webcam data. So if I just tell you webcam data, and you might have played with it before, it usually starts with a laptop or a computer, anything that either has a webcam or it's connected to a camera. And in JavaScript, you would use navigator.mediadevices, get user media, you deal with the stream, and what you end up with is usually a browser with the camera feed, and you could, play, you could build stuff like uh, you know, video communication apps or live streams for conferences and things like that. But you can build a lot more interesting things with code that's a little bit similar if you add in the middle uh, machine learning. And here, that's the logo for TensorFlow uh, JS or TensorFlow, because that's what I've been working with. But there's a lot of other libraries that don't necessarily rely on TensorFlow JS. And uh, what it means is that you still get the stream from the camera, but you add a little bit of thing to it, so that then you end up with uh, an alternative interaction. So instead of just displaying the stream in the browser, you use some kind of like machine learning and predictions of what is in the camera feed to then interact with a web page. So I'm going to go through examples of things that I personally built. There's other people doing things, but in general, you're kind of like the expert of what you build. So uh, I feel better talking about stuff that I did, so I know why, how, and all of that. So the very first thing that I want to show is uh, using facial expressions. So I don't remember, I mean, I don't know if some of you remember the game Rain Brow. That was an iOS game uh, in 2017. And it went viral because basically the only interaction with that, uh, with that interface was with facial expressions. And you only had two facial expressions, I believe. It was like, if you look angry, then the little emoji goes down, and you're supposed to like, uh, get stars. And if you look surprised, then you go up. The thing is, I don't have an iPhone. I'm an Android person. So I thought, well, how do I play then? And what is the best way then to just recreate it, but in JavaScript, in the browser, so that all the non-iPhone users can also play with it as well? So I'm going to try to do a demo, hoping that the lighting of the stage is good enough so that it will pick up on my face. But if I, OK, the camera is on, I can see it. And then if I tap anywhere, and I do like, oh, I'm so shocked. Oh, wait. <gasps> and I'm frowning, mm -mm, and it goes down. Like, <laughs> well, it doesn't come with the sound. You don't have to do the sound. But uh, you know, it's like, oh, la la, woo woo. Anyway, OK, so <laughs> I'm going to stop showing it here. But the point is basically that it's uh, looking at my facial expression in the feed, and, uh, and then you only get that as an output of working with JavaScript. It's, it was built with a library called faceapi.js. And you only get the label of the facial expression as a result, and you can play uh, with that uh, as, as an input to your interface. So I really liked the fact that, uh, obviously, maybe the real creator of Renbra maybe wasn't really happy that I you know, basically reproduced the same thing on the web. Um, but I like the fact that if you use the skills that you already have as a front-end developer, you can actually create a platform that is accessible to a lot more people than uh, only iPhone users. 
so that's working with only facial expressions. But then you also can use face landmarks. So uh, again, that is using a TensorFlow.js and a model called Face Mesh. You actually have access to a lot of key points in your face. And instead of only getting uh, fa a facial expression as an output, you can get the X and Y coordinates of a lot of different points of your face. And with that, you can build whatever kind of, um, of interface that you want. So this project, it was silly. It, was, uh, it started as a friend of mine tweeted something at me on when, at the time when Twitter was better. Uh, and he said, like, oh, I think he was streaming with a camera, and he was saying, oh, I would love to be able to like zoom in and add on of my camera just using my eyebrows, so you can have like some funny effects when you're streaming. So uh, again. I'm a JavaScript person, so I thought, okay, I know how to use face mesh, and I don't have a camera plugged in into my laptop, but you know, you can have the feed from the webcam, and using Canvas, you can zoom in on the Canvas. So it's like, a, I'm going to try to do it. And it was actually pretty interesting. It's the first time that a goal of the project was to calculate the X and Y coordinates differences between my two eyebrows. So, ooh, okay, I don't know if that's going to work because I'm not seeing myself very well. But I think if I raise my left eyebrow, no, okay, ooh, wait. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> so wait, I'm gonna try to because I need to zoom out after. So if I do that, okay. Oh wait, not that. And then no, get away. So there was another thing. But anyway, so I realized I can't zoom out. I can't raise my my right eyebrow. Stop. Okay. I can't. I can't uh, right uh, raise my right eyebrow on its own. So I have to do this. Okay. So uh, that's. <laughs> you know, you learn very important things when you build stuff like that. <laughs> Um, right, so you see now what I mean when I say people pro before me were pros and now I just build stuff like this. Um, but it's, uh, it's just it's interesting. Obviously, if you wanted to re recreate an interface that was using face key points, you probably wouldn't want to do this. But it would actually be interesting to take that project and actually hook it up with a camera, maybe using the web USB API and being able to be on a stream, maybe like, you know, do a weird face and it zooms in and, and you, can, you can have fun with this. I'm not a streamer, but I assume that maybe it would be fun uh, for streamers. Uh, but to kind of get away and get a bit more broad, uh, you can do face detection in general, not necessarily using um, a model that, is, that can recognize faces, but you can use something that's called a teachable machine. So I'm going to try to show you this one, where uh, I used it for my face, but you can, it's, it's doing image recognition in general. So the UI is like very small, yeah. I built that a long time ago. So uh, what I have here is like I have four labels, right, left, down, and neutral. And what I'm going to do, it's uh, taking screenshots very fast of what is going on overall in the webcam feed, so it has no idea that there's a face on it. That doesn't matter. Um, but I think if I tilt my, OK, I'm going to record samples, then I go left, then I go down, and then I go neutral. And if I start the prediction, I have a keyboard. And as I'm moving my face, it's like selecting letters. Oh, no, the other way, the other way. All right, so I'm going to close the tab. So, uh, <laughs> so you can, and the thing is, uh, I trained, I mean, the, it's using transfer learning. So there is a model that is pre-trained with other samples before, and you're able to, um, to train it with your own in a few seconds. Like my demo, well, it didn't really work well, but it took a few seconds to retrain the model. You can have it a lot more accurate if you record more samples. And also, obviously, the lighting on this stage is coming from above, not, not from, uh, from like in front of me. So if you ever work with camera or webcam data, uh, this is one of the downfall, uh, all the things, the limitations that you get is that it has to be uh, pretty bright for it to be able to recognize things properly. But again, it was like one of my early explorations of what would a UI look like if uh, I could, in this case, write with the head movements, but you could also scroll down and up or press enter or do whatever you want. The thing is, as soon as you realize that it's possible, then you can have the creative work of thinking about the actual interaction. So that was for face. But you can do, you can, you know, take a step back and see a bit bigger and look at post detection. So. This is kind of, again, it's using TensorFlow.js. I did not intend to have this talk about just TensorFlow.js, but as I was putting all my projects together, I realized there was a common theme there. Um, and what this is using another model that gives you key points about the, the entire body. So not only your face, uh, but it can have like where your shoulders are, uh, you know, elbows, wrists, uh, knees, and all that stuff um, relative to the size of your screen. So you get X and Y coordinates, and you're able to control interfaces with this. And the idea for the project here that I called uh, Beat Pose was to, um, there was an open source repository on GitHub that was a clone of Beat Saber in JavaScript as well using the A-Frame uh, A uh, library. And, but at the time, to connect to it, you had to use, I believe, the joystick from uh, an Oculus Go or Oculus Quest, I forgot the name, like the VR headset. And again, it's like, well, I didn't have one at the time and I don't want to spend 500 dollars uh, on a VR headset if I can try to rebuild my own version. So I thought it'd be super cool to be able to like smash some beats with just my hand movements. 
So I'm just going to play the video hoping that it will... Wait, the sound is not really good because it was recorded in my apartment and the acoustic wasn't good. Or, ooh, not that. Uh, so I'm going to just pause it here because basically you kind of like saw the point. And if you are a player of Beat Saber, you might be thinking, well, it's not as fast and I want to make bigger movements. But again, um, the, so this recording was with using the first version of their uh, kind of pause uh, detection model. And now it is a lot more performant. I updated the project with one of their latest version and I was actually able to play in like advanced mode, so a lot faster. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, if you're working with this, the interesting part as well is that the world is created in 3D coordinates but the detection is in 2D coordinates. So to be able to have the collision detection, you have to do some uh, pretty tricky logic in how to be able to map 2D coordinates to a 3D world, which is uh, a little bit complicated, and that could be another talk, but not today. And uh, so using pose detection as well, oh, no, okay. Uh, a thing that I built at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, at the time, people didn't really know if you could even go outside apart from buying groceries. And uh, I wanted to go for a run, and obviously, uh, I was like, well, I don't know if I can, and I just moved to Amsterdam at the time, so I didn't really know where to go. So I used the same concept. I think I can play, I think there's no sound, so there's going to be sounds of birds. So, uh, and as I'm detecting that I'm running, I'm playing a video on YouTube that somebody uploaded, and if I stop running, it stops. So if I want to see the end of the trail, uh, I have to keep running, basically. And the thing is, these videos sometimes are like two hours long, so I would never do that. But uh, sometimes, for a little bit, you can run, and I projected it in the living room because I guess in front of the laptop, it's like a lot, it's not the same experience at all. And then uh, at the end, I just tried to create a very simple uh, 3D world uh, so that if I didn't like the videos that were on YouTube, I was like, oh, maybe I could run in like my sci-fi world. And obviously you could create much better things if you're spending more time on it. But again, it was me trying to validate, is that even possible? And there was interesting uh, engineering work around, well, what does it mean to be running? What, what would be the coordinates of, my, of the key points in my body to be able to do this? And I called it quarantine, haha, <laughs> funny. So, uh, <laughs> so then uh, another one using pose detection is uh, a clone of a Fruit Ninja that I, uh, that I built uh, as well. And all of it is also in JavaScript, so the fruits, I forgot, maybe they were made in Blender, but then they're loaded in the browser using 3GS. And the uh, motion detection is also done in TensorFlow.js, and I had that same issue of mapping 2D coordinates to the fruits to be able to like slice them and stuff. So I'm going to try to do the demo, but again, with the lighting, I'm not sure. So I preloaded it, so it should be OK. It's loading. Do, do, do. OK. So if I, let's see if I. Yeah, smashing fruits. OK. So see, sometimes the. Woo! Okay. <laughs> And now game over. But <laughs> and again, my interest in this is that if you're looking at your phone or your iPad, it's such a small screen. And if you're looking at the interaction of really like smashing things, you want to be able to take a lot more space. And uh, obviously, I'm still restricted to the size of my laptop because I'm using the, the webcam. Uh, and again, it's like this is because it's JavaScript. You could actually rebuild all of this in other programming languages and, and actually be able to create uh, real you know, uh, interactions in a bigger space. But I like to be able to take that kind of same interaction and create maybe a more uh, human thing. It's like if you want to slice stuff, then my natural interaction would be to like slice like this. So I don't want to be like doo -doo -doo on my phone, it's boring. Um, ooh, okay, so uh, a more recent one that I, uh, that I built is you might have seen a Squid Game on Netflix, but if not, basically in the series, there is a game where, so everybody is in a room, there's like prisoners or something like that, and where there's, there's a robot that counts to three or that sings, and you're supposed to run uh, to, like towards the, the end of the room, and if the robot turns and you move, you die, and uh, you have to, obviously, everybody wants to live, so you try to um, reach the end. So I'm going to play, so uh, again, I have to give credit, the UI at first, I stumbled upon it because a front-end developer called uh, Louis Hogrubt, I might really pronounce his last name really terribly, um, but he created the UI and I stumbled upon it, but it wasn't with, really with that, with, that, with that kind of interaction. I'm not sure there was interaction or it was just the animation, but then I was like, oh, but I can like add on to it and, you know, collaborate with, with other people. So if I play it. <sighs> it 
says you won for people who can't breathe. Right, so again here, you're like, what does it, obviously, if, it, if I'm not moving, then, you know, again, if you're thinking, you know, uh, if you're an engineer putting an engineering hat, or even if you're not an engineer, it's like, what does it mean to fall? You know, what kind of key points around my body do I want to focus on? And what's the threshold between, like, I'm moving slightly or, or a lot? Because even in the series, they're not completely still. You can move, like, a little bit, but if you're making a bigger movement that it can detect, then um, you die. And I thought it was an interesting, it was almost like the perfect kind of use cases for uh, applications like this, where you have an interface on the laptop, but you can kind of bring it to life. And here, I'm only on my own, I only did one, um, one person detection, but I believe the model can detect multiple people and it would kind of be fun to even make it like an even bigger, maybe like an art installation or something. Something more useful if you're a designer um, is to use body movement to design websites in Figma. So I'm just going to play it. So again, I'm going to talk over it as well. So obviously, if you're a designer, you'll be like, well, I do a lot more than that. So I know, I know. Um, so my, in terms of interactions, I just, I'm just pinching my fingers, and I'm bringing layers to the front, and I'm just placing them on a UI. And then I just have uh, an, extra, um, an extra gesture to be able to zoom in and out. So I know that when you're using Figma, there's a lot more that you do. But once you start realizing, OK, so you can send, you can track hand movements, then send them to, uh, to Figma and then decide what you want to do with like a Figma plugin. So it was a very hacky Figma plugin. Uh, if you want to really publish a Figma plugin, you can't do that because they don't allow access to camera for security reasons. But as a prototype, it was really interesting because everybody watches these sci-fi movies where people like draw interfaces in space and super cool movements, but we never really do that in real life. So now that, you know, if you could, what kind of gestures would you want? What would you want to be able to do in Figma? Because I'm sure there's things that wouldn't actually be nice to do with hand movements. Uh, for example, typing still, you know, with hand movements is not really great. So you might still want to be able to type the name of your layers with your keyboard, but maybe you would want to interact with voice commands and then do gestures for another thing. So it's kind of like, uh, interesting uh, experimentation. So then if we get out of the browser, you can also use uh, pose recognition for more of like room-size computing. So it's something I had looked into uh, a while ago, and that's just a terrible prototype. There's much better ones out there. But it's being able to adapt what you're building to your house. So I have two lights behind my TV, one purple and one blue. And as I'm moving my different arms, so the right one turns on the right light, the left one turns on the left light. and in this prototype, it's still using my laptop on my coffee table, so it's still on JavaScript and then pinging uh, the API of my Philips Hue lights. But the real point of, of a much better prototype would be able to really point at devices that you want to turn on. So here, that was just an exploration. But uh, let's say if I wanted to then turn on the TV, I might have a specific gesture just for that TV. Or if I have my coffee machine like on the left, then the, you would you know, be able to create a room that understands you rather than you having to understand your devices. So I think the main limit why it's not really possible right now is because when you talk about cameras, people are a bit freaked out. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to put like a Amazon camera, even though there's already security cameras. But, um, but I don't have one. I don't like this. So, but I like experimenting with this and making it open source because I want people to be able to build, to build their own stuff. And uh, then you can deal with your own security uh, if you want. So moving on from post detection, I want to go a little bit more focused on gaze detection. And this one I might not try it live because I don't think it's going to work. Um, but it's basically using the direction of your eyes to write and here on a digital keyboard. Um, but am I trying? Try it? Not try it? How much do I have? Ah. <laughs> right. You like when it fails and then I'm like so lonely up here. Um, okay. So I have. Okay. So if I look left. Yes. Okay. Right. No. Right. No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to write the letter I. Yay! Woo -hoo! All right. So, <laughs> so the point here uh, as well, I don't know if you have uh, noticed, but this is when I realized that when you're doing keyboards on uh, on the on the web page, it's actually really. It was not a good idea in my first example to just select one letter at a time with my head. It would take a while. But then if you split the keyboard into two columns and you let the user decide where is the letter, so you end up doing kind of binary search uh, with your eyes and you allow people to write faster. And this was actually um, uh, I reproduced a project that, was, that Google had made as like a research project that was on the phone as well for people who had limited mobility. And again, I wanted to see, well, OK, if you can do it with, uh, on, on the phone, uh, you should be able to write the kind of same interface on the web uh, as well. And, uh, and it works. And then you know, I started thinking as well, what if it works with a keyboard like that? With gaze detection, you could also try to do hands-free coding. 
There's other ways to do hands-free coding. I've seen people experiment with uh, voice detection. But in this concept as well, um, so I'm just going to explain the layout a little bit. So on the right, I just move the code away from uh, the browser, and I put it in an Electron app, so it stays in JavaScript land. And then uh, I realize that when you're coding, there's also a very limited amount of things that you can do. Uh, if you want to declare a variable in JavaScript, you have var, const, let. Uh, if you want to create like a data type, there's also a very limited uh, set of data types. So if you look at all the things that you can do, you can kind of create uh, a map that you can select with your eyes as well, and then it would send that to VS Code with a plugin, and you can create, you can use snippets so that instead of having to write every letter of a component, there's also snippets that you can use to create, uh, you know, one of two types of components, and then you have hot reload in the browser. So I'm moving my eyes, it's selecting whatever I want to write. I'm using snippets so that if I write like RS, RCE, then it writes the component uh, for me, and then I select letters uh, with my eyes, and it's just gonna uh, I think I wanted to write hi with an I, but it, I used it like a Y. That's fine, it works as well. Um, and yeah, so it's like a very early as well exploration of what it could look like if I was spending more time, what would it look like to actually be able to write code with your eyes? Because if you, you know, if you combine the fact that you can do some kind of binary search between what you want to, um, to select in an interface, and then you're using snippets. Basically, technically, I wrote a React component in like less than 30 seconds with my eyes. So it's like really thinking about how we're writing code um, uh, with that as well. So just to recap, because I'm going to move on to an, uh, another type of input data, uh, you can do facial expressions, you can get the landmarks on, uh, on your face, you can get pose detection, and you can get gaze uh, detection as well. So there might be more, but that's what I've personally uh, experimented with. So now let's move on to hardware data. So what do I mean by hardware data? Uh, here, you know, it could be a joystick, uh, but anything that gives you data uh, from a piece of hardware that's not usually the keyboard and the mouse. And in general, the way that you you know, connect that with the browser. You would use either Web Bluetooth API, Web USB, Web Serial, or a custom Node.js module that you would have on the server and streaming whatever um, event or anything in the browser. And if you just use this, it's already kind of an alternative type of interaction because it's not the keyboard, the mouse, or a swipe. So it's already another way of interacting with an interface. But again, if you add machine learning in the middle, you're able to eventually maybe create your own models with your own custom interaction. You don't buy a device and you have to use it the way other people told you to use it. You can kind of create um, your own things. So one of the very early examples of what I did with this is uh, using an EMG sensor, so it's muscle sensor. It was uh, an armband that was called the Mayo. Uh, I say was because I think you can't buy it anymore, but if you're interested in doing something like this, uh, you can buy different electronic components of muscle sensors, and you might have to do a bit more work because it, it, you know, it would really be custom. But this, uh, this armband was, when you were setting up the first time, you had, uh, you had a set amount of gestures that you, could, uh, that you could record. So basically, if I was moving my hand like this or like this, it was recording the live electrical signals and then kind of like matching it with that label. And when you were then using it with live data, it was able to recognize, kind of do pattern matching with what it had uh, recorded before, and you were able to, uh, to control things. And considering it was connected with Web Bluetooth, I used the Web Bluetooth API, and I could get uh, live events in, uh, in the browser as well. I don't think I really did that much in the browser. It was more like, oh, controlling drones in JavaScript with my arms. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much where I stopped. But I'm sure you could do much like more interesting stuff. Ooh, brain sensors. So um, this is like one of my early uh, experiments as well, where the very first sensor that I bought was called the uh, Emotive Epoch, which was in the pictures of Tammy's talk uh, this morning. That's why I was like, ooh, somebody else who plays with brain sensors. And uh, you can actually do stuff in JavaScript as well. So my, one of my first experiments was to see what it would look like to, um, to interact with a UI. So, I mean, yes, with a 3D UI, as if, you know, kind of like early VR uh, brain-controlled uh, experiments. So this, uh, this was made in 3GS as well. So the landscape is like very, so, you know, I tried to go like, Tron-like vibes. I'm not a designer, you can see that. So, um, and here what I'm, what I'm doing is I have uh, mental commands that I trained. So the same way that the Mayo was recording uh, data of certain things that I trained and then uh, matching that with live data, that does the same as well. I trained mental comments that was, I think, going left and going right. And then uh, using live data, it's able to match what it had recorded before. And uh, when I'm going left and right in the UI, it's all done with my brain. Um, so that was like one of the really, very early um, prototypes as well. But one of the things with that device is that to get access to raw data, you had to pay, and you had to pay quite a lot, I think, or at least 
more than what I was comfortable uh, paying because I wasn't making that much money at the time. And uh, also, if I only prototype with it, um, you know, you know, once or twice a year, it's not really worth it to pay like a monthly fee. So I moved on to another device that was called the, that is called the uh, Neurocity Notion, and now it's the Crown. The new model is the Crown, and the concept is a bit the same, where uh, I trained two mental commons and I tried to play a brain-controlled clone of Street Fighter. You can see it's a clone. Like they're really just two characters, and only one of them is uh, is like that's basically me. And uh, I will train two different gestures where um, I think when I'm tapping my right foot, it's doing like a Hadouken, and then the other one. Um, but yeah, so very much a prototype. I didn't push it that much further. But working in th with this, I realized that, well, OK, first of all, there's a bit of latency, depending on uh, on how good you have trained your uh, your thoughts. I mean, that's weird to say. But and also, uh, it's a bit hard. It's it's actually hard to focus on a specific thought and not really just like you know, mind your mind starts going somewhere else. But I also realized, okay, so in general, it works better if you trained if you train two thoughts. And uh, but then, okay, so if I have only one or two thoughts, what kind of game could I work with around that you know, as a constraint? So I decided to do the dino game. There's only one input. So, uh, <laughs> so with the dino game, your only input is the space bar. So here, uh, you can see my very serious face. And uh, you know, I'm like, again, I'm trying to think about tapping my right foot, and I'm trying to like, and at first, I'm not too bad. And then it starts to like go down. But you know, it's when you know when you start to be like distracted by the fact that you lost. I'm, I'm still I'm trying like lo losing and losing and losing. But uh, it's interesting. As, a, as an interaction, because again, I can simplify my code by only having one gesture, and then I can actually find a type of interfaces that works with that gesture. So obviously, uh, you can't really, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to pair that with uh, a car or whatever, you wouldn't want to do that, even though some people have uh, with Tesla. But I think it would have just been like accelerate or something, which is still very dangerous. Um, but you start learning about that kind of technology before it's um, before it's available uh, everywhere else. So moving on from wearables, uh, if you are into more clothing or fashion tech, you can also work with conductive thread that you can pair with a JavaScript system as well. And this particular project was actually, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with uh, Project Jacquard. That was a few years ago, between like a collaboration between Google and Levi's. And they had made this jacket, I think it was for cyclists, where if your phone is in your pocket, to avoid you know, um, having you like, looking at the screen, you could pick up a phone call or play or pause a song by just like touching the thread. And again, I was like, well, I don't want to buy a jacket just because I want to know how this works. So I bought just some fabric conductive thread, and I saw them in a grid so that instead of just having one endpoint of like, am I touching it or not, if you saw them in a grid, then you're able to uh, use all interactions as a potential uh, X and Y coordinate for a UI. And here, uh, I tried to uh, recreate the one of the UI that they had in their experiments, where, again, it is 3GS, so JavaScript in the browser. And now you can start to see, well, actually, it could eventually be used in either another 3D uh, environment where it could be a game, but even in a 2D UI, you could have certain gestures um, that, that could be interesting to build uh, as well. What do I have next? Ooh, OK, so uh, motion sensors. So usually, uh, IMU sensors, they can also be, it's, you can also say uh, accelerometer and gyroscope. And uh, in this experiment, I had, but at the time, I wanted to learn to play drums. I still want to but I didn't. So, uh, and I had this friend who was a drummer, and he told me about these devices that you can buy for when you want to drum uh, and you're traveling. So you have these devices you can attach to your drumsticks and two that you attach to your feet, and they're motion sensors, and you can play like air drums. And when I bought them, I realized, oh, they tell me I have to download a piece of software, and I don't want to download things. I want to do it on the web. So uh, I built a JavaScript framework to connect the devices to the web via web Bluetooth, and then because you only get JavaScript data in the browser, then like the world is your oyster. You can do what you want. You can attach whatever sound you want. Uh, you can, you know, uh, add animations. So here was me trying to trying to be cool in my living room. <laughs> oh no, not that one. Okay, wait. I, have, I think it's on YouTube. That's why. Yeah. If you're a drummer, you're gonna cringe because I'm not very good. <laughs> I fucked up here, that's why it's like mm. <laughs> That's basically the only pattern I know, so I did it forever. 
Uh, but it was really cool. It was super fun. And here I use the drums in the way they're supposed to be used to play music, but you could try to do something else with them. You know, you could interact with other uh, devices. You could uh, turn on your lights by just doing a certain gesture, or then you could use machine learning later on uh, to be able to... I think, I think you can get raw data from them as well, whereas here I'm only used the MIDI uh, signals that you're, that you're getting. But staying in uh, motion sensor land, uh, this one is uh, probably one of my kind of favorite that I built. Is uh, again, so using accelerometer and gyroscope, I think I, I came across an art installation that was doing something similar, but I wanted to do it in uh, in the browser. And what it does is that I. Uh, I kind of wanted to create a hoverboard experience, you know, back to the future. Uh, but again, in my living room by myself. And uh, I have like an accelerometer and gyroscope on a skateboard that is on a carpet. And I'm just moving the natural gestures that you would do on a skateboard, so like tilting back and forth. And using this natural gesture, you can... Oh, no! I forget which one is on YouTube. Anyway, uh, I thought I was ready for this. So, yeah. I'm connecting, standing on my skateboard and uh, having fun, basically. <coughs> Alright, I'm not going to play the whole thing, you, you get the point. Um, but again, it's like using natural gestures because on a skateboard you're usually tilting back and forth. I could have added also like tilting the front to go faster, like woo, or whatever. Uh, but again, it was a prototype, and when I realized, oh, I can do it, then you know I can decide to go further with it uh, or not. But again, the UI is uh, made in 3GS. It probably would look better if Guillaume was making a 3D uh, UI. But you know, it's like now you know that you can uh, you can inter you can interact with interfaces that way as well. And again, the projection is just because it felt better when it was bigger in, in front of my laptop. It would have been a bit weird, but that would work as well. So if you don't have a projector, it still it still works. Yes. OK, so this one I wanted to try to demo it live, but I'm not sure that's going to work. So I'm, I have a video recording, if not. But so repurposing the um, uh, I'm going to try to speak and figure out how I'm going to do this at the same time. So um, here I have the, the same UI prototype of Street Fighter that I had used with my brain sensor before. And then I thought, OK, so brain sensor, I could see that there was a little bit of trouble because there's not that many gestures and it's not always quite responsive. But would it, wouldn't it be cool to be able to like play Street Fighter in real life without having to like type on my, uh, on my keyboard? So I tried to do that. And usually, I did not. The first version wasn't using my phone. It was using another device that had an accelerometer and gyroscope. But knowing that you can get motion data with a web API as well, you could actually use your phone as a controller and hold it in your hand and try to uh, punch things. So I tried it this morning. It worked. But sometimes it doesn't. It depends on Code Sandbox. Sometimes Code Sandbox is happy with me, and sometimes it is not. Um, so once this is loaded, All right, OK, now, and now I need my phone because it's uh, using WebSockets. So do not let me down. OK, so I'm going to start. I'm the red character. Oh, you don't see a bit here. OK, so if I do, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, so if I do, I do yes. yeah. Oh my god, it's so good. OK. No, not that one. OK, so you know, it can always work. But that's fine. So it's like using, um, and the way that I did this is, I'm going to go back to my slides, stay safe. Uh, and so uh, this was like probably the most complicated project I've uh, uh, built because it was, even though you get raw data from accelerometer and gyroscope in JavaScript in the browser, for it to be able to understand my gestures, I had to uh, use machine learning and record all of these samples and create my own model and then uh, doing all of it in JavaScript. And the, the, but the cool thing though is that we're probably all kind of punching the same way. So even though I made this model for myself, I'm sure that if people were trying it, uh, you at least the punch. I think would kind of be similar. Uh, so hopefully, you know, obviously it's a prototype. There's only the red character moving. But if I was pushing it a bit further, you could have like a real game with two people where you would just like punch, uh, you know, in the air. And I feel like it's such a better interaction than you know pressing buttons on, on a keyboard. 
But, uh, oh, well, that was a video, but you saw it. So just to recap that part as well, uh, muscle sensors, so I use the my armband, but you can find uh, others around or make your own if you're, uh, if you're adventurous and you, and you like tinkering with stuff. Otherwise, uh, brain sensors and accelerometer and gyroscope, but there is a lot more out there. So there's infrared sensors and a lot of other things that you can work with, um, and I'm sure some of you might have already worked, worked with that. Okay, so I'm getting to... No, I'm out of time. So the third uh, input that I want to talk about is audio data. And this one is like, I think I stumbled upon it uh, more recently, and it kind of like, you know, made me think about things differently. So if you're thinking about audio data, usually you might, you know, you have a microphone, and if you're working in the browser, you might use navigator.mediadevices.get user media, but you turn on microphone, not camera. And what you end up doing in general, people you, uh, build visualizations. So either a spectrogram or a music, you know, a music visualization, some cool stuff in the browser. But again, if you've been following this talk, what do you add in the middle? <laughs> uh, so machine learning. So if you, uh, if you also add a machine learning to this, you can learn patterns from that sound data and use that as some kind of interaction uh, as well. So one, one example of this is um, something that was, I kind of repro recreated a um, research paper that was around acoustic activity recognition. And it was really, I had this kind of like, whoa moment where the paper um, focuses on the fact that a lot of different things that we do every day produces sound that we recognize. If I ask you to think about the sound of la like, toaster when it's done, you know, kitchen, like you know, you know that, or or even in your house, the sound of when you open the fridge, you can tell that somebody's opening the fridge from another room because you've kind of uh, you've understand you've understood that that sound is linked to that particular activity. So here in JavaScript again. Uh, I think if that loads, I don't need the camera anymore. Uh, so if that loads, I'm going to see. So as I'm speaking, okay, there should be the spectrogram of me speaking. And when the model is loaded, that might take a little bit of time, so I'll just keep talking. Um, it's going to show, yeah, it's going to write the label of like me uh, speaking there. And if I stop and I do uh, fake coughing, <coughs> 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 okay, so it recognizes the pattern. You can see here the pattern of what coughing looks like, and then it's able to, um, and phone ringing, not really, but uh, it's fine. So sometimes, you know, it, it, there's a little bug. But again, it's the prototypes that I make uh, on the weekend, but you can see that what it does is instead of using raw data, it's actually uh, taking captures of, of a spectrogram and then using uh, image recognition models uh, so that it's more performant than uh, audio data would be a lot, uh, really too much for a model. But, um, yeah, so then working with this, I didn't really push it further either, but I had people who were telling me, like, oh, it would be great to get my kids to, uh, to brush their teeth. You know, you could have like a system that's listening and that, you know, tells you from another room if your kids are really like, you know, uh, brushing their teeth or something. I did try it. Brushing teeth does work. It's a sound that I did train. I just don't want to do it here. But, uh, but yeah, it does work. And uh, you, could, you, you could have systems like, for example, if you're following a recipe on an iPad and you're cooking and you could train to recognize the sound of chopping something on a chopping board. That's like a sound that you could recognize if you've ever cooked before. And you could pause the video automatically if you're, um, if you're chopping so that you don't have to go back and forth between uh, your UIs and what you're actually doing. So that would be one example, but there's, there's uh, a lot more that you can do. And using this same code, I actually rebuilt something. Um, if, I don't know if you have an Apple Watch, but when Apple, uh, I think in 2020, their annual conference, they released this thing with Apple Watch where it would recognize the sound of running water and it would start a counter for 20 seconds to make sure that people were uh, washing their heads uh, during the, the pandemic. And the thing is, when I was watching the conference, I realized that, oh, I think I know how to do this. So while watching the conference, in two hours, I put this thing together and, uh, and it works. It's like you, I didn't have to use that much water to train it uh, because uh, people were a bit uh yeah, people thought that I had like, you know, really wasted water. It was like, no, I used less water than a toilet flush. So it was done really quickly. And then the UI is a counter. And um, and yeah, so I shared that. And it's basically the same thing. But instead of having to buy an Apple Watch, it would work on your phone or iPad or laptop or desktop, anything that can run JavaScript. And you don't have to spend a lot of money uh, on an Apple Watch. And I was a bit surprised that the only thing people seem to say is that my laptop is too close to the water. Who cares? I don't care. This is another point. Uh, so, but yeah, apparently the, the rest doesn't matter. And more recently, uh, a few days ago, I actually, I mean, a few weeks ago, I, I read research around using uh, the sound of touch on your face to create on-face interactions. So it's the type of, again, I've been thinking about sound, but I didn't think about more subtle sounds. So if you're touching your face in different ways, it's close to your ear. Your ear might, you, you might realize that your ear picks up on different sounds. So if I'm tapping my cheekbone or like, you know, rubbing my cheek, it creates a different sound. And using the same kind of system with machine learning and sound data, 
you would actually be able to recreate uh, interactions as well. So in this very rough prototype, I used tapping on my cheekbone to scroll a web page, but uh, you could do a lot more, and it can work with any wireless earbuds, because uh, even though if you have Apple earbuds, you have some interactions built in, like if you're tapping it will, or if you're tapping on the device, it stops or pauses the song, but not everybody has uh, Apple uh, earbuds. So you, with something like that, it could run with anything, and uh, you can create your own kind of custom interaction uh, as well. So that was uh, yeah, a pretty rough uh, prototype. But anyway, so I'm getting to uh, the end of this talk. I just wanted to show quickly, I don't know if I'm kind of in front of the links, but if you ever, uh, you know, here are some of the links of the things that I talked about, but if you want specific links uh, that are not there, but I, that I mentioned, feel free to uh, talk to me afterwards. But I, I don't have a very inspirational way to end this talk. I just wanted to, uh, to like, I hope that with this talk, maybe you've learned something, or maybe you're thinking, oh, actually, yeah, you're right. I want to interact with interfaces in another way than what I've been used to uh, in the past. That would be uh, that would be my goal. I understand that we're using the keyboard and the mouse because it's fast, but if you remember the first time you learned it, you didn't really know where the keys were, and you were probably a lot more slow than you are now. And I feel like we're dismissing all other types of interaction just because like we want to like be fast and productive. But as as uh, technology increases, even brain sensors, I know that at the moment it probably sounds like something that's never going to make it, but, uh, but uh, the hardware on devices is getting better and machine learning model, uh, models are getting better. Uh, I don't have the link to the research, but I was, uh, there's something I wanted to read recently. They launched a research where they were able, they were able to reconstruct a song that a participant heard only via only using their uh, brain waves. So that kind of just, that's creepy a little bit because you know it's not going to be it's not going to be used for good. It's like if people can match what you're thinking with actual words, that's I mean it would be basically reading your thoughts, which is not great. Uh, but if you are building you know my own little thing just as an experiment, uh, it could be it could be pretty interesting. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for your time. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> thank you.